Hello, everybody. Welcome to our last webinar of 2017. Woohoo! hoo <laughs> um, We're uh, going to um, finish our webinar with a webinar about the special issue of GEMLE, the Journal of Media Literacy Education, that was devoted for uh, media literacy and disabilities, and trying to start a call for action into looking into where are the intersection and how the media literacy community can really look at issues of disabilities and what are those um, issues. So what um, we're going to do uh, now, I'm going to introduce some concepts about the special issue and the topic of media literacy and disability. And as we go along, we're going to have discussion uh, about the different topic. Hopefully by the end, uh, we can start thinking about what should be the next step because the idea of this special issue was to start a conversation as we have now, uh, but not to stop there. So I'm going to start with um, sharing uh, my um, screen. Can everybody see my screen? Okay, great. Uh, I'm going to go to presenter. Here we go. So, um, the opening article is kind of the introduction article that I wrote that tried to do three things, and it was like a summary um, of the, um, the special issue, a short literary view, and kind of the connection to <coughs> media literacy and where to go from there. So... Um, my name is Yanti Friesen. I'm the Associate Director of the Media Education Lab. Um, um, and uh, I'm an assistant professor at uh, Columbia uh, College in Chicago. I'm just moving there. Um, so to start, I want to um, look at the special issue. And everybody can look at the special issue by looking at mle.org and that will get you into the current issue which is the special issue on media literacy and disabilities and there you can see uh, all the 10 articles um, that are available uh, online. Um, the uh, Journal of Media Literacy Education is an open access peer review and is looking at interdisciplinary uh, scholarship that are looking at media literacy education and this was a special issue to raise um, awareness about how media literacy is um, looking at issues of disability. So just to give a little bit of um, a general kind of understanding, so worldwide in the um, World Health uh, Organization that did a survey in 2010, they found that 11.8% of world population, and that's 59 um, countries, <laughs> Uh, have disability, and when we're talking about um, a developing country, it uh, jumped to 18%. Uh, in the US, we're talking about 22.2% uh, of adults, 4th by 4% of children 5 to 17, and 13% of US students. Um, and we can see that the number, like, differentiate depending on if it's the census, if it's the um, uh, different organization that are uh, looking at different numbers and different um, people and who they're including in those statistics. But in general, we can see that uh, as people are getting older, there's more disabilities, and also that there are different definitions of the more medical versus the educational, and we're interested in the educational uh, definition. Um, so, to start the conversation, um, you who joined the conversation, can you tell us a little bit about your connection and why are you interested in this, if you are interested in this topic, and how you are related um, to that? I can start, I guess. Sure. Um, can you hear me? All right. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, I teach um, digital literacy writing and other writing and rhetoric classes. And um, we started the year this year with uh, Brenda Brueggemann from UConn talking about universal design. 
and it got made me more aware of um, just how important it is to make sure that my teaching is reaching all of my students. Um, I have students come in with with plans sometimes and ask me, you know, if we can work together. And I usually don't have any problems with it because I think it all works. But recently, I had a student come to me and, and tell me that it wasn't working for her. So what could we do? So it brought my attention to the fact, and that was in a in a digital literacy class. So it brought my attention to the fact that um, that when we start exploring media literacy, especially in when we start branching into electronic environments, that some people struggle and and what are the ways to remedy that? What are the needs? Where to go with that? I, I just feel like I need to learn more. So. Thank you, Frank. Janine, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, well, uh, you all know me, so obviously we know I have a disability. And uh, I had polio as a child, so I grew up in a world before. Um, ADA and before any of the 504 educational um, acts were passed. So I've seen a, a pretty large change in, uh, in the educational system since I started, but um, obviously not enough. It has not gone far enough. And so I concentrate most of my work on, um, on trying to make um, people aware of, as, as Frank said, universal design, um, and also make people aware of uh, how uh, improved education and the world could be if it actually included and promoted more um, accessibility and inclusion. Uh, Yanti, one of the things I liked a lot in your um, piece that you wrote or the introduction of it, and that's why I was just pulling it up here. You say that um, by looking at inclusive practices and disability, instead of using the term special education, we wish to start a productive discourse on how media literacy can, uh, education can promote its core principles to all students. And, um, and that's something that uh, I think a lot of us have been working towards for quite a while because um, language is important. And I think as long as sometimes the world uses that, uh, that term special education, um, everybody feels okay about, well, that's for somehow, you know, special kids and special needs. And that I find to be detrimental to actually creating inclusion. So I like very much how you're um, going about it in this, in this piece and in, in your practice. Okay, thank you. Danelle? Sure, uh, my name is Danelle Probst and um, I am on the Student Leadership Council at Namely and finishing up my Master's in Library and Information Science. Um, and I'm actually come from the perspective of being a parent of a child with a disability. Um, and so it's been really fascinating to me. My undergraduate was in media studies. And so coming from a special education background, I was a um, special education advocate for, I don't know, I think about the last decade or so. Uh, kind of out of necessity and then ended up homeschooling uh, my daughter through her high school years um, because public education would just wasn't a great fit and a lot of that was due in part to um, just her perception of what life was um, for other kids and you know what they were doing that she wasn't included in and a lot of that came from what she saw um, online and in social media so it was really interesting to me because, you know, as a special education advocate, we always, you know, pursued um, that social emotional learning piece as a necessity of their education because, you know, when you have problems outside of the school or within the school with your peer relationships, it drastically affects your performance in school. So it was really interesting to me that hadn't, but it hadn't seemed to transition to the digital environment. And so that was one of the things that um, kind of caught me into <laughs> this whole topic and I've rambled on to Yanti about it for years so I was excited that he uh, <laughs> had me put it on paper and put my thoughts down and 
kind of send uh, my article out as a trial balloon to see, you know, what kind of feedback we could get on this issue because it's um, something that I don't think has really been done so far. So that's yeah. where I come from. And we're gonna get back to your article uh, later on when we're doing the connection with media literacy. So some of the connections um, are personal, some are with family, some are with our students, but it's really difficult today to find somebody who has an encounter uh, in their own circle, somebody who has uh, some kind of disability. And also as we are getting older, we also trying as starting to see our own kind of getting into different disabilities and different things that we need, um, different needs need to be met differently than it was before. So I want just to, to show a little bit of like a history, like a short review before we delve into the actual discussion. And um, when we're talking about disability theory, we're talking about the idea that nobody identify as a person with disability as part of one huge group of people with disabilities because each one has their own particular needs and because of that the the person don't associate himself or herself with other people who have their own particular needs and that's why when we're talking about inclusion it's very um important to understand that it's not talking about one set of needs, it's about the idea of including people that have a variety of different needs and there is really a diversity that needs to be acknowledged and work on how to work that. And that's why what Janine was talking about, when you're talking about special ed, it makes you put in a box that all those special people have special needs, but actually it's such a diverse set of needs that we should look at it as a disability and what is the specific disability of the particular person and how can we address it in a setup that would acknowledge other people's ability and disability. Any question about that part? Okay. So I'm not going to go through the history of the uh, legal uh, battle, but um, Starting with the Education for All Handicapped Children Act in 75, acknowledging that uh, students uh, have different needs and need to be addressed. And into the 90s with ADA, the Americans with Disability Act, uh, and with IDA, the Individuals uh, with Disability Education Act, understanding that students would need their individual educational plans and again, it evolved more with No Child Left Behind, but legally, there's starting to be more acknowledgement about the educational system needs to be more inclusive. Now, in the media literacy, um, we can see that there were not many, but there are some um, articles that are talking people that have different needs that are looking at media analysis. And those three are just examples of um, those um, ways of how we're using media literacy to analyze representation, to help people that have different as English as second language, they have behavioral like issue, to do an online, uh, not online, to do an analysis of media representations and work on their own um, agency. And then there is also the production part of using media literacy to produce text and how those texts um, help the students or the, the children or the youth to develop their agency to talk about issues uh, of uh, disability, to work on that um, toward their own, um, as I said, agency. Now, as you see, there's not much, but the discussion that we wanted to bring with the special issue was, as a media literacy community, what is our duty um, to work with people with disability? Should we do more research? Should there be um, a practice? And I want to have a discussion uh, before we go into introducing the special issue and what were the article there, 
what do you think from your perspective the media literacy community should do? Um, so I'm opening up to discussion and whoever wants to um, jump in and to, to, to add. Okay, so I'll, I'll jump in here. I think, uh, you know, one thing that I find myself thinking a lot about is about um, the instructional practices, how, how inclusive are the instructional practices that we uh, include? Like even for instance, our use of this technology, Zoom, right? So uh, for hearing impaired people, this is a really challenging, or visually disabled people, this is, this, this technology itself presents a certain challenges. So, but, so, so the reason why I've been thinking about this is because you know, all instructional practices have a set of affordances or limitations and uh, adaptations can be made, but only within a, like a limited set of parameters. So I guess I've been thinking about how, um, how diverse are our instructional practices uh, and what adaptations are appropriate for people with disabilities. Thank you. So other suggestion questions, it can be thoughts that so far we have. Yeah, I think that, um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Frank. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't see anybody, sorry. Um, I. I Going back to what Janine said about, you know, the word special and what that implies, I think trying to continue to break down those walls to get people to um, learn how to collaborate and create more comfortably, and reach out and learn to use resources more comfortably. Um, but also that what Renee said about us having to know how to provide those resources and those opportunities. So I think, I think both sides of that discussion um, play a part in the middle, the media literacy community, not only in terms of teaching and learning media literacy, but using media literacy as a community to um, inspire those things to happen. That's all, I'm muting. Danielle? Yeah, I think um, it's interesting. So I think when you look at a lot of, you know, what has been done or what is being done, like so much of it, I mean, I think like we're just kind of at the tip of the iceberg as far as, you know, really zoning into like, you know, ideas of representation and like media and things like that. But I feel like as like a practical application of media literacy for people with disabilities, like I just don't feel like that's really out there in part of, you know, significant way at this point. Um, yeah, I mean, at least that's something that I find very difficult to locate, <laughs> you know, so maybe it's buried somewhere, you know, but it's, you know, I think that we have a lot of um, analysis going on and not a lot of kind of practical application of ways to, um, you know, kind of have that access piece, you know, like how do you, you know, like Renee said, the instructional piece or technology we're using and things like that. So I think it's, I mean, I, I feel like this is like such a, like we're so at the very, very, very beginning of this, which is exciting, um, but also a little daunting. <laughs> yeah. So. Right, I feel like we're, we're just at a point where we're um, discovering what technology can do and, um, you know, not to hop on things, but for example, what social media, what their implications are. Um, for example, I've just discovered in Brazil, they're developing an app where one person can, um, you know, speak and use a verbal language into a phone and the app will actually translate the verbal language into um, an avatar who then is doing sign language. So I think that um, we don't know yet what the possibilities are. Um, and so I think that uh, some of the things, instructional practices um, have, have vastly improved, but there's still a long way to go that we need to uh, um, analyze for how it's best used and how 
uh, you know, media has been used in the past to um, to give us a lot of the impressions that we have. So some research as well, um, or not maybe research, but more um, publications about uh, knowing and understanding about why we have some of the uh, perceptions and assumptions that we do. So I think that there's a lot of stuff that can potentially happen that we're just at the cusp of. Yep. Yeah. So, I have a couple of questions that are not like really regarding um, the implication and everything, but like how to like how are people um uh, what are the conceptions of a disability that um, in the media or um, that in the general understanding? Um, I just I you know. I have kind of a conception of a disability, but I think that the definition of disability um, from the ADA uh, definition, it says it's more of a law, a legal concept uh, versus a, a medical one. And it, de it defines people with uh, not only physical, but also like mental impairment. Mm -hmm. So um, when I when a lot of people think about what disability will be thinking like, like people with handicap or or like uh, reading or or hearing kind of um, disability, but I'm not sure if um, you know the like kind of a mental kind of impairment that has included in, in people's conception or or what is represented on the media. And if, you know, media literacy can do something with um, inform uh, the general audiences and, you know, um, help people understand and help people understand what people with disability that needs, um, you know, um, if, you know, media literacy can make some effort on that. Yeah, and, and there is also the learning disabilities besides mental um yeah so we'll go over and and try to tackle those things as as we go along so the, the special issue um was trying to um use four different types of articles to kind of answer all those issues about instruction about representation about how to do it through um um three theory pieces, two research pieces, um, three voices from the field, and a review of materials. So the theory we had, uh, Betsy Dalton was um, doing the connection between universal design for learning and media literacy and the core principles and trying to see how um, universal design for learning can be used um, with media literacy uh, principles. Um, April Leach um, used um, production in her literacy classes in the school with students with learning disabilities and was able to use through the production ways uh, of uh, having her students to really uh, work um, and, and learn literacy skills because there was production component in it. Um, Donnell, you want to talk about your article? instead of me introducing the article. Hmm. I'm unmuted now. Yes. Um, <laughs> so my article is basically um, born out of, you know, my experience as a special ed education advocate um, and how we would approach social skills from a, you know, face-to-face -face perspective. Um, and, you know, then having gone through my undergraduate media studies, it was really interesting to see kind of the parallels that existed between the two, uh, between, you know, social media literacy and um, our social skills that we would work with um, on IEPs and, and things like that. And so a lot of that, you know, aligned, some of the case cell com competencies aligned to, um, you know, some of those namely principles. And so things like self-awareness and self-management, um, responsible decision-making, uh, relationship skills, social awareness, like those are all things that kids um, with, you know, things like autism spectrum disorders and social and emotional disorders struggle with. 
and a lot of the outcomes were very similar too. And so it was really interesting to kind of put these two things together and look at how, you know, when you have a kid who is really struggling with um, social and peer relationships, you know, there are some of the outcomes for those things, you know, are a lot of the same outcomes that you have with kids who do not have good media literacy skills. So you're looking at eating disorders, you're looking at self-harming, um, you know, extreme behaviors, um, being uh, sexually active, or, you know, ways that are inappropriate, sharing inappropriate information online. And so as I saw with my own daughter, it was really interesting to look at how all of those things that she already struggled with were magnified and compounded by you know, her interaction with social media and looking at, you know, the way she viewed her body, the way that she viewed her relationships with people and the way that she viewed the relationships that other people had with each other. Because as a kid with a disability and she um, has Asperger's, she was often, you know, would perceive that she was being left out of all of this stuff when, you know, as we all know, in reality, a lot of this was just constructed, um, you know, lives that people were creating online. And so it was really interesting to kind of, you know, tie those two things together in the paper. And then I sat down with her, um, you know, and I, I've been doing this for years. And so it was a fairly, you know, simple um, kind of road for us, but looking at, you know, can we really put in place something that's more structured um, as far as social media literacy that follows all of the principles that we already know and use, you know, but using that as an intervention on an IEP. So rather than, um, you know, kind of using the antiquated face-to-face -face social skills, um, or in addition to those addressing some of these um, social skills issues, social emotional issues that come from using social media um, and, you know, viewing media online. Um, and can we use that as an intervention? Because, you know, that's really how kids are communicating these days. You know, I mean, if anybody has kids or works with kids, you know that, you know, um, they spend the majority of their time online and, you know, consuming every tiny bit of information about people they know and don't know. So um, I would, you know, try to create a framework where we could um, look at, you know, how can we really align the competencies and build something that was more concrete that then we can hopefully someday push out and, you know, start working with some teachers and um, educators to, you know, see if this is something that's viable and that will have positive outcomes for these kids um, as far as using social media is concerned. Um, you know, and it was interesting to work with her. We did some different interactions and, um, you know, we let her pick images from her feed, um, which was a little tricky because uh, we had to, um, you know, it's generally, you know, I, generally people that she knows. And so um, we used that in the paper and she was really, um, it was interesting, a lot of the, you know, kind of feedback that she would give on different images. And, you know, again, it was really what we would typically see, but a little more intense and a little more compounded. I and mean, it was a little bit more difficult um, for her because she is very concrete, very black and white. And so, you know, she looks at images and consumes them in a very different way than my 13 year old son who does not have a disability and kind of, you know, takes everything with a little more grain of salt. I can, you know, explain something to him and he's kind of like, ah, okay, yeah, you know, and, and he understands it um, in a more abstract way and will generalize that to other things. Whereas, you know, it takes a, more time and um, many more examples in order for her to kind of pick up those basic competencies, which I think really highlights why this is needed, not just for, you know, our typical kids, but is needed on a much more intense level. Um, in the form of like an IEP intervention for kids with disabilities. And I want to highlight that point because that was really something that relates to what Renee was saying before. What we tried to do in this special issue was that each one of the articles had the end section was application. And in your case, you actually laid out an IEP so that the intervention is in school can look at this article and not just read about the theory and the, your suggestion, they can actually take it into their own setting and practice and try to see how social media literacy can be used as an intervention in the school. And I think that was a huge contribution that your article did. And I really think, thank you for doing that. Yeah, well, you know, and I think it's interesting too, because 
I think so many teachers, you know, they, and we all hear it, you know, when we're talking with educators that, you know, there is the issue of, you know, kids constantly having their phones. And so my hope was that in laying out, you know, when you look at, hey, here's what, you know, the effects of social media are, your media consumption on a, you know, a typical kid. And then when you have a kid that's already struggling with those things, you know, and you're going to see some significant behaviors and things in your classroom that are going to impede their education. And I think a lot of teachers recognize that. I don't know that people generally make that connection of kind of that compounded effect of students with disabilities. So that was kind of my, you know, hoping to kind of create a little awareness at the same time and then giving some practical application because, I mean, it's all well and good if, you know, but if they can't find a way to implement it or understand it, you know, then. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So that was the first part. The second part was research and Ilya Powers and Beth Heller um, looked at um, 45, I think, communication books and looked at speech disability and how speech disability is represented when you're teaching public speaking, because usually in a communication degree, you always have public speaking. And they really didn't find many um, representation of it or even addressing the issue of anxiety to speak uh, in a way that uh, can be related to um, a disability. And then uh, Jane Lammers and her student, Nicolas uh, Palumbo, um, examined fan fiction as a website and what is the accessibility of the website itself and does the website that helps really promote media literacy and, and looking at um, fan fiction is really accessible for teachers and students who want to use that in their classroom as part of a media literacy uh, class. So those two articles were part of the research. And then Voices from the Field, we had uh, Jacqueline uh, Siegel who were looking at uh, ways that she used media literacy, especially in the two last presidential campaign and with her students with learning disabilities. And she has lesson planned uh, with uh, as appendixes to the article looking at what were her successes and challenges with uh, her students with learning disabilities. Uh, and that's in middle school. Karen Festa uh, works in elementary school and she did production. Uh, she is a special educator and she's co-teaching um, with um, a typical educator, I would guess that would be the term. And then together, um, they did production and uh, for a book trailers, and that really helped the students that had different disabilities. Um, some, uh, really, there was a variety, and she described how really it helped them to develop their agency and the ability to produce a message, while if it would be written, it would be really challenging. Uh, that was a huge help um, for um, those students. And then in that um, section, the last one, Jane um, Kubage, uh talked about her production classes and how actually there's no accessibility if you want to be a produ uh, student to learn production, there's a lot of uh, barriers if you have a physical disability. So in order to uh, do radio production, to do studio production, there's so many physical barriers that it's something to be considered if we want to teach media literacy and production to students, how are we looking at accessibility? And then the last article from uh, Juliana uh, Cuscinelli um, is about three digital platforms that she did in her university with her students and how they addressed by making those platforms and also helping the community with people with disabilities to help more mobility more understanding and kind of addressing issues uh, of, uh, again, accessibility. So we can see all of that that is part of the, this special issue. And what I tried to do in my opening article is to look at the four main ways that I think um, in special education, uh, digital media is used. So just to give a brief 
kind of introduction and then we're going to talk about it is there is assistive technology that's supposed to help access and that's integrating into your lesson plan and into what you're working but it's totally transparent in the idea of media literacy there's no questioning about the technology the students are given the technology saying that that's a technology that's going to help you use that to read better to hear better to have whatever access to the content but there's no really a critical lens about is it really the best technology who's producing that why am i using this technology and how there's no questioning about the whole process and then educational technology is usually to inform what was used only as videos now there's many more apps and different ways but that's just receiving it's kind of top like top bottom kind of the students are being um given the technology saying that's how you receive the information and the critical lens is totally overlooked you don't question who produced that video that you're showing me uh, who created it why is it created what's the purpose of it it's just oh that's the information and i should take it and then there is the maker movement that is for more expression and production but um it's not really used to question the whole production and the purpose and the target audience it's we're creating we're expressing ourselves that's great which is great but there's also a critical lens that should be added to it. And then the last one is e-health. It's more for treatment. So how do you use technology not to assist, to educate or to express, but actually as an intervention or sometimes rehab. But again, that's like not in Corinth, I was trying to be settled, but if you dare to question your interventionist about the technology, that's really outrageous. Like, no, this is the tool, that's what we're doing. Why are you questioning the process or the tool itself that the interventionist is using? So those are four ways that digital media is used, but none of them have what we like to do in uh, media literacy, which is to ask, what is the purpose? Who's the target audience? Uh, what is omitted, right? So the technology um, is used on one way to help, but it's, I feel that, and that's why I wrote this article, that media literacy community should look beyond accessibility. Yes, we got really far with giving more access, but now we should look really from a critical lens into why, to whom, and how we're doing and using this technology. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to like add, to give a comment, to ask a question before we, we go to the last part of the webinar. So Yanti, I have a question for you. Sure. One of the common um, big ideas in media literacy is rooted in the concept of representation, you know, looking at stereotypes and bias. Mm -hmm. In this special issue, were there any articles that focused on how, on the representation of people with disabilities? And then my follow-up question is, do you think that the formal examination of issues of representation of people with disabilities is a useful pedagogy? Why or why not? That's a great question, two great questions. So I'll answer the first one and the second one, I'll, I'll let also other people to um, answer that. So yes, in fan fiction um, and in the uh, review of resources, um, there was uh, examining the representation of uh, different disabilities um, and the, it was part of the review. So. The article showcased how to do a review that uses disability theory, but also uh, showcase how it's been like done and what's the benefit of it for that purpose. So you have in, in different articles, um, um, the actual analysis of representation and biases. And again, as, as Donnell was saying, this is the beginning. I feel that there's much more work that needs to be done and, and addressing that. And to the second question, 
that's really tricky and and that's part of the thing that we're looking at um i from my experience i feel that the more you're analyzing a silence community or a, a community that is underprivileged you reinforce that um silencing and that oppression and in this case i think that does this kind of thing and and the pictures that i put here in the presentation you can see some of them that if you would really analyze deeply that can create a lot of of backlash in the way that it would reinforce the suppression so i think and that's why i'm a production person i feel that the combination of analysis with production together is the way to go uh, not only with issues with disability in general that's my belief in media literacy that without reflection production and analysis you can do each one of them separately but they need to come together because then this is really one um complementing the other to do a a holistic kind of uh process but that's my view i want to hear other people uh answering rene's question about the analysis and if that's the way to do it i don't know donel or janine if you want to uh jump in and and Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I think kind of, and if I'm understanding what you're saying, Yanti, I think that it's, I don't know that you can separate them. I think that, you know, you do have to understand that representation that exists because it is fairly um, embedded for people with disabilities. And I know, you know, Janine has talked about that with us before. And I think part of the problem is that there's not a whole lot of representation from people with disabilities in the disability you know in the media literacy community that are really um you know part of that conversation I, which i think is always uh, you know an issue with disabilities like we've you know we've got a lot of the you know able-bodied people trying to de, you know <laughs> decide what definition or you know how it should be defined and i think you know janine said a lot of work um you know on that aspect of talking about those you know those representations so i think that it's kind of a two-part process like i think that you know we have to understand those representations and we have to help others understand those representations and then you know i think then we can go move on to that piece of you know teaching those media producers you know to be cognizant of that and you know if you are creating a piece about someone with a disability there should be someone with a disability that you know is involved in that process or helping people with disabilities become media producers so that, you know, those are their voices and not the voices that, you know, we assigned to them. Um, but I mean, I just think, like I said, that the whole thing is just overwhelming because we're so, you know, just at the very beginning of this. So I think there's room for all of it eventually. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, and I think you're right. It is that, um, that triad of, um, of uh, using it for access to inform and for expression um, together, not uh, separately from each other, but um, how they uh, add into and inform and play off of each other. Uh, for example, I've been watching, um, you know, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer for a bazillion years, as we all have, and the animation is just, you know, great and uh, and all of that, and, and I get what they're talking about. This is the first year I have ever seen um, suddenly not people in in the academic world, but people just out in the social media world, um, and I don't know if there was some uh, you know, original articles that instigated it, but across social media, when they came out with it this year and announced, you know, it had been all uh, remade and colors brightened and, you know, did some uh, push on it being a 50th anniversary or something, social media was flooded with people talking about Rudolph and Santa being a bully and what the uh, Rudolph's father's um, position in this was of getting him to, you know, like hide the red nose. And so I think, again, um, social media has provided uh, these really interesting opportunities that um, 
I have never really seen uh, reflected out in the general population kind of conversations in the way this recently was. And um, it, it just blew me away. It was, it was, it was great. And people were, were, you know, taking all different sides and it was a really um, amazing conversation. Great. All sparked by Rudolph and his red nose. <laughs> So, and you know, when it went around too, and how the lessons we have to learn, and even Santa is allowed to learn lessons, but you know, shouldn't Rudolph have been accepted anyway, even before he was accidentally needed on the foggy night? I mean, people were really doing some amazing media analysis over, you know, the land of misfit toys. Nice. So, I want to um, conclude, we have. Um, yeah, Pam, in a second, uh, we have like five more minutes. So in just to, to sum up the article, and then I want to open to like um, concluding remarks. Um, there is, I took the core principles and tried to look at how we can use it for um, um, using as we talked about as a practice with people with disabilities. So I'm just going to skip all of that. but. Um, what I wanted to conclude is as a call for action, so we have like a little bit around five to seven minutes, what should be our next step? So Pam, like if you can reflect as what you wanted to say and then also answer the question, what do you think should be the next step? Okay, so my uh, comment was going to be sort of a follow up to Renee's uh, question about representation and um, Janine kind of uh, played into it as well. And that that's about audience. I haven't heard, except in a roundabout way, much of a discussion about audience. Like who are we looking at to inform about disabilities? I, I can see that media literacy can be used with the um, population of people with disabilities uh, to look at their representation of people with their own disabilities, et cetera, and to create their own messages and to have help them um, inform the public. And that would be the other audience. Like who, uh, what about the general uh, public and how they examine things ab about people with disabilities and their own ideas and prejudgments. Um, what came to mind for me was a video I just happened upon today about that kid like from Texas or somewhere yeah. whose mom filmed him being about talking about being bullied and how viral that has gone and how there's all these celebrities that are uh, talking to him now. So um, Next steps, wow. Um, I guess um, I would want to see some kind of uh, brainstorming that expands on what this has been and your um, special edition to um, really talk about the things that can be done for various audiences. Thank you, wow. So anybody in the next like, five minutes want to address what Pam was talking. So yes, the audience is people with disability, but as I explained in the beginning, people with disabilities are so, like it's so varied into the different types of disability. And even in the same type of disability, there are different needs because of the particular context. So issues of audience, we're talking about media literacy, how can we really um, promote such an inclusive practice is when there is such a diversity and of of the audiences. Oh man, um, I think that uh, going back to what Renee said earlier about uh, the, um, I, I, no, I just lost that thought. But going back to the idea of universal design, I think that we we need to go beyond the labels and we need to be become cognizant of how to use media literacy um, instructionally our own our own media and our own literacy skills have to be able to be able to provide that but also how to become cognizant of and design ways that um, students and learners can explore their own skills something as simple as um, a digital literacy skill of uh, I, I I used a uh, version of the um, handwriting versus typing deliberation that we did a couple of summers ago 
with Troy Hicks. And it was really interesting to watch. I gave them two podcasts to listen to and an article to read and then asked them to deliberate. It was really interesting how they all went to their own personal needs. And, but the, and then secondarily, it was really interesting to see who focused on the audios and who focused on the writing. And um, I really got to know my students' needs by doing that. The other thing I wanted to share was how um, up until a couple of years ago, even I was guilty of this, trying to push them so hard toward um, digital literacy and building and using electronic environments and, and using technology that I didn't realize that some people just do better if they just write. And, and I had to adapt to that and say, well, what can I do to be, you know, to, to reach all my students? Well, I can teach them how to scan what they write if they want their early drafts to be writing, you know? And that, that was an indicator that, that I had to look beyond my own narrow way of thinking that, oh, this will be a better way for them to learn. So I think that was the main point I was trying to get to. Okay, thank you. Janine, any concluding thoughts about the audiences and the next steps? Um, well, I think it's, it's pretty clear from what you talked about earlier that, you know, um, policy, law, those things have to be affected. Um, if that doesn't happen, it doesn't really, um, you know, address public and public education. Um, I think that um, <coughs> we're not at that tipping point yet. And, and unfortunately, I don't want to open up a whole, you know, political Pandora's box here. But um, in the climate that we're in, all guidance of... Uh, using IDEA, for example, has disappeared from the federal government's website. And so if you're a parent and your child just got diagnosed and you've just been informed as to, you know, well, you have some uh, legal rights under IDEA, if you go to that website, all the guidance has, has disappeared. And, and I think that a lot of those things that are getting rolled back are incredibly troubling. And um, so I think a lot of advocacy and awareness has to be done about those, um, those policy issues as far as uh, where we go in education. Um, one more example is that this whole... Um, charter school movement I find deeply troubling um, in that many charter schools uh, have basically have parents sign away their rights um, in order for that kid to attend that school as to what they are actually eligible for under um, federal laws, ADA and IDEA. And in order to get a scholarship to go to that school, you're, these parents are basically, you know, um, swindled is a harsh word, but I feel like that's really where it's going. Swindled into saying, if, if you want your child to come to this lovely charter school and get these uh, benefits for it, scholarships, those kinds of things, you signed these forms and basically you're signing away any right to challenge the schools on what the school's educational practices are. So I think there's a lot more advocacy that, um, and awareness that needs to be done around um, educational rights. And, um, you know, I don't know exactly how you do that. Um, you know, w Million Women's March or the, you know, hashtag Me Too. I mean, I think we've seen some really powerful campaigns happen out there. And I think there just has to be more of that. Okay. Danielle, last words. Yeah, um, I, I agree with Janine 100%. I think, you know, I think I always come from the perspective that when you've got something big like this, I mean, in special education, we always used to say that change is like molasses. I think, you know, with any major movement, that's generally how things go. Um, and it's really hard to convince people that change is needed if they don't understand what the problem is, which I think that's right true. now... Yeah, right now that's kind of where we're at. I think that it's becoming more apparent. Um, I think, you know, we're working towards that, but, um, you know, I think that's probably going to be 
our biggest challenge is, you know, really helping people to understand, you know, what needs to change in the media, the messages that are created about people with disabilities, what, you know, issues of access are, um, you know, what special education needs to do on this front. Um, I think, you know, it's a really, really big daunting task. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, it is, I feel like it's gaining a lot of momentum fairly quickly, which is always a good sign. Um, and I think probably the thing that we need the most right now is to figure out what is happening out there. I think, I feel like everybody's in these little pockets doing their own work. And, you know, I mean, we always used to joke, you know, all the special ed advocates would say that, you know, special, ed special education parents are like, you know, trading special, you know, information about special education law, like they're, you know, exchanging drugs in a back alley. <laughs> like it's this, you know, kind of, <laughs> kind of this hidden world. And, um, you know, and I think right now that's kind of what we're doing with media literacy and disabilities. Everybody's kind of got their own little thing going, but we don't really have kind of a scan of the bigger picture um, of, you know, what is everyone doing and are there ways that people can connect and, um, you know, gather strength in numbers, I suppose. Okay, wow. So I, I really think and hope that uh, as we go like further and do more initiatives, yes. we're gonna address at least several of, of those issues. And thank you so much everybody for spending a Monday evening, uh, like around friends and this important issue that, um, I really looking forward to continue and, and see how we can really address the issues of audiences, representation, and, and advocacy that we all talked about. So thank you so much for participating and looking forward to our new webinar series in 2018 in January. Awesome. This was fun. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Happy holidays.